Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Pakinathan. I'm a consultant in HIV medicine in South London. Uh, we're here uh, today at the Kocha Clinic at St. George's Hospital to kick, up, kick off a series of seminars on HIV uh, because all the evidence shows that uh, being well informed about HIV and its effects on an individual's body, the medication, how the medicines work, means uh, having a better quality of life, a longer life and a healthier life. So these are a series of seminars specifically directed at people living with HIV uh, and we welcome everyone who's come today uh, but also welcome you if you're watching at home. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end here after uh, the, this mini lecture uh, but if you're watching at home I'd suggest if you've got any questions write it down and maybe discuss it with your HIV doctor or nurse uh, when you're next in clinic uh, because being better informed uh, means uh, uh, being better at managing uh, your health condition. So, um, if you can see, I've got a slides coming down the back here, so hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, well, what does HIV stand for first? It stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. So it's a virus that specifically affects human beings, so it doesn't actually infect uh, uh, other animals, just human beings, uh, and it causes immunodeficiency, and I'll describe what that means specifically a, a little bit later on. And, you know, there's a whole host of viruses that affect the human body. There's the flu virus, the cold virus, viruses that cause warts. And this is just one of those viruses, a different virus. And this virus doesn't cause a wart to grow or your nose to become runny. It affects the immune system and makes it weak. And therefore, its effects are maybe more serious uh, than other viruses. Uh, but it's human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV transmission, a little bit about it. Many of you will be aware that the main mode of HIV transmission or how it's passed on in the world is from sexual contact. And that's usually from unprotected penetrative sex. So that's sex involving the penis in a vagina or the penis inside the anus or anal sex. And those are the commonest ways in which HIV is transmitted. So from unprotected uh, uh, sex, vaginal or anal sex is the, the most common ways. It can be transmitted from mother to child, particularly during childbirth, uh, and, and sometimes uh, through breastfeeding as well, particularly if the mother is not on treatment and breastfeeding a child uh, because the child's uh, mouth, esophagus, stomach are not well mature, and the HIV virus can be found in breast milk and it can be transmitted this way. Um, it can be transmitted if people uh, inject drugs or share injecting equipment. Um, Welcome for those of you who just joined us. Uh, and, and, and the virus is transmitted usually through contamination, uh, contaminated blood uh, or, or HIV, uh, blood containing the HIV virus, uh, either in a needle or in works. And for those of you who might inject uh, drugs, uh, what I mean by works is spoons, filters, anything, any paraphernalia you might be using uh, to draw up the drug. As well as just as well as the barrel of the syringe and the needle itself. Um, occupational exposure, yeah, there have been cases of people acquiring HIV from occupational exposure from needles, from needle stick injuries when a, a, a needle with HIV virus goes into a doctor or nurse's finger. And finally, in the past, before we were screening blood for HIV, uh, some people have become infected or got HIV from blood transfusions or organ transplantation. So these are the common ways, sexual contact, pregnancy and breastfeeding, injecting drug use, occupational or uh, from blood donation or organ transplant. So these are common transmission modes. And I thought I'd say something about when HIV is more easily transmitted. So the virus is much more likely to be passed on to someone if the level of virus is higher in the blood or in the body fluids. And that happens most commonly, it's highest when a person first picks up HIV so when a person first picks up HIV and is undergoing what we call seroconversion, uh, then they're much more likely to transmit uh, HIV to another person because the level of virus is very high in the blood. And I'll show this, uh, 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 it, we'll discuss this a little bit more as we go along. Uh, a person who's not on treatment for HIV, many of you will already be on treatment for HIV, but if you're not on treatment for HIV, it may be that the level of virus is higher in your blood uh, and then it's more likely to be passed on. Uh, because people with on treatment for HIV tend to have lower levels of virus. Uh, if you've stopped treatment for any particular reason, then you're more likely to transmit it, or you've missed a few days of treatment, the virus level can come up. 
if you've got an illness, so if you are not on treatment and then you become ill with another illness like tuberculosis or if you acquire a sexual infection like chlamydia or gonorrhea, then your level of virus can go up, particularly in the secretions in the genital tract, like you know, fluid from the vagina or from the penis, and like semen uh, could have high levels of virus, and then it's much more likely to be passed on. Okay, so these are situations when transmission are more likely. So if there isn't a sexual infection, there isn't a coexisting infection, if you're taking treatment and your level is low and you've had HIV for some time and you're not seroconverting, it's not like the first few weeks of picking up HIV, then the risk of passing HIV on is much lower. Okay, and we'll talk about this. We're going to discuss transmission specifically in a few weeks' time at one of our specific lectures on transmission where there'll be plenty of time to discuss the ins and outs, ins and outs of this. Okay, so HIV in the body. It seems to be a mystery how HIV causes illness. I mean, and, 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 and because of, of the days before we had treatment for HIV, many people died of the complications of HIV and developed full-blown, what people, people used to call full-blown AIDS, or we still call it the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. Um, and in this situation, uh, people's immune systems became very weak, and I'll discuss what that means in a minute. Um, but how does that happen? So how does the virus lead to so much devastation? What actually happens? Now, we talked a little bit about having a cold earlier, which is when the cold virus, I've got a cold at the moment actually, so I won't go get too close to me. Uh, the cold virus actually affects the membranes, the mucosal membranes of the nose and the back of the throat. So those cells, the cold virus is particularly attracted to, it sticks to it, and then the body tries to fight it, creates inflammation, and then you produce a runny nose and you sneeze a lot, and that's what happens with the cold. With the HIV virus, it doesn't like, well, it has a specific cell which it targets, and it targets a group of cells found in the body called CD4 cells, okay? So there are different types of cells in our blood, there's your red cells, which carry oxygen to, the, to your organs, and there are white cells, which are primarily involved, mainly involved in looking after the body to help fight off any infections. Okay? <laughs> and the CD4 cells is a subset or a subpopulation of the white cells. So HIV enters the human body, and it doesn't go for the eyes, the liver, and the kidneys. Well, it does actually go for the kidneys. We'll talk about that in a minute. It goes specifically for these CD4 cells because it likes them the best. And the job of the CD4 cell in the human body is to coordinate the immune system. And I liken the immune system like the army. So we've got a troop of army troops, for those of you, if it doesn't project so well, we've got a, a group of army troops and they're going to defend your body against infection. And the CD4 cell is like the army general. It coordinates the army. It says, you go there, you defend here, you look from troop people from the back, and it, it protects you against infection. It coordinates the immune system. So it's got a coordinating function, the CD4 cell. So your CD4 cell is like your army general. So if your army generals are being attacked by a virus, what you've got is an army that's in disarray. It doesn't know quite where to go, what to do, uh, what to prioritize, and therefore, the human body naturally becomes much more vulnerable. And I've got a picture of a lock and key specifically here for a reason, and that's because it's a bit like when the HIV virus enters the body, it's a bit like it's the lock and it's looking for the, it's like, it's like the lock and it's looking for the key to fit into it, or it's the key and it's looking for a specific lock. And Viruses and cells have things called receptors. Receptors are a bit like the hole of the lock or the grooves on a key, where there's a specific, they specifically fit to each other. So the HIV virus has some proteins on its surface, okay? For those of you interested, the most important one is something called glycoprotein 120. And then it fits into the hole of the lock, which is actually CD4. So CD4 has the perfect shape to fit in with glycoprotein 120. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when the HIV virus enters the body, and it, it, it'll bounce off most cells, it just bounces off most cells, but when it finds a CD4 cell, because CD4 cells have this CD4 molecule on their surface, they stick to it. 
and it can enter the CD4 cell. Okay. And what actually happens at this point, and we've got a picture of a, a factory here, is that it converts the CD4 cell to a factory for HIV production. So we've got a car factory here. And a car is a good example of an assembly of the HIV virus. So the car, if you imagine a car factory, you first make the steel case, and then you make, I don't know, the tires, and then you add the engine in, and then you might put the upholstery in, and then put some fuel in, and the oils, and all the rest of it, the lubricants, and you've got a car ready to go. So if you imagine the HIV virus a little bit like assembling a car in a car factory, but this is happening inside the CD4 cell, where basically the virus is going in, it's um, uh, picking up bits of things it needs uh, in order to make new viruses. So the CD4 cell, which used to be an army general that coordinated the army to protect you against infection, is now busy making HIV. So he's, his, his or her function has been transformed into something he was not meant to be doing. And in that process, he dies. And the number of CD4 cells slowly go down and down in the body. And the poor army, which is supposed to be defending you, is, well, not quite knowing what to do. And what we've got here is, some, uh, is a pictorial, I've got a picture of a reservoir with clouds on top, probably not projecting so well in, on the film here. But we've got a reservoir pouring water down, downstream down the river. And you've got the rain clouds producing more rain. So the level of the reservoir stays roughly the same. Is that right? Because when it overflows, it flows down. But as the level drops, the rain clouds produce more rain and the little rivulets bring more water into the reservoir. Mm -hmm. So a reservoir stays fairly constant. And it's a bit like the viral load. So when a person first gets HIV, all these factories get produced inside the army generals of the CD4 cells. And there's virus, new virus being produced. So initially, there's a big increase in virus. Uh, which is when a person becomes sick with the HIV seroconversion. And eventually, the body does control it because the immune system... I mean, HIV is just another virus, just like my cold. I mean, my immune system is fighting my cold just now. Uh, and the immune system fights off HIV as well. It brings it down, but it doesn't quite clear it. So you get this level, like you get the reserv a reservoir of virus, that you don't quite clear, okay? Where there's new virus produced, like the raindrops up above, but the immune system is clearing any excess at the same time. It's what we call the viral set point. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And really, I've got my sleeping troops here. Picture, we've got a picture of sleeping, sleeping troops. And really, with the army generals being not too busy being factories for HIV or dying or the levels going down, the army just takes a break. And then the person who's got the virus becomes vulnerable. His defenses, her defenses are down, and infections can come in, cancers can come in, and the body just ignores it, uh, because the troops are asleep, okay? So this is what we call the natural history. So in medicine, when if we follow a particular disease or an illness, it's what we call the natural history. So what happens if you do nothing? So if you just let a virus come in, and wreak havoc and do nothing, this is what happens. But obviously in real life, we would treat someone and get them better, and we wouldn't just let this happen. But in the days before treatments, um, this is probably what happened to a lot of people. So initially, a person develops seroconversion. So at this point, you've got this acute, what they call the acute retroviral syndrome or seroconversion. Really, it's, it's like a bad flu when a person first gets HIV. And then there's a long period of what we call latency, or where a patient is asymptomatic, or where they don't know, they don't feel anything, they feel fine. Um, and then, as the, you meet the CD4 count is going down here, the little red arrow going down there, as the CD4 goes down, uh, a person may develop some minor HIV-related problems, like thrush, like shingles, uh, uh, symptoms. And then as the immune system becomes very weak, a person may develop what we call an AIDS-defining illness or an acute immunodeficiency syndrome illness. A serious illness such as pneumocystis, Jovetii, pneumonia, uh, or a brain abscess due to toxoplasma. And some people have been very sick 
uh, with HIV-related complications because the immune system has got really weak. And if that's not treated, a person can die from HIV. And that's really what happens. And really, intervening before a person becomes too ill is key because at whatever point you intervene, whether it's at the acute stage, the asymptomatic stage, the HIV-related illness stage, or even the AIDS stage, the clock can be turned back. So if you're watching and you think, but I'm very ill and I've already developed AIDS, don't be discouraged because being on treatment, even at this stage, can turn things around. You know, it's not too late to test and to be treated. So what happens at seroconversion? And this is, I think, an important message to get out because the, all the evidence shows that uh, if you treat someone at seroconversion, number one, most things are less likely to pass it on to someone else, which is what everybody would want. Uh, but also it means they're detected early and they don't go through, they, they're less likely to develop complications related to HIV because they've been detected quickly. And seroconversion can feel like a bad flu. It can last up to four weeks, but typically one to four weeks, and usually happens two to up to six weeks after exposure, typically at three or four weeks after exposure. And a person with HIV at this point may develop a sore throat, fever, swollen glands, and sometimes a rash. Uh, and if someone's had a, a, a at risk at risk from exposure at a particular point and they become ill like this two, three, four weeks later, then it's important for them to come to a clinic and say, look, I wonder if this is HIV rather than glandular fever or a flu. Maybe this flu that I've got is due to the HIV virus and not the flu virus. So it's, I think it's important for people to know that, particularly, um, particularly for gay men, actually, who've had maybe unprotected sex and then they develop these symptoms at least they can be uh, picked up quickly. And then this period of latency, and I've drawn, I've drawn this rather doomsday cartoon, but it doesn't have to be a doomsday, because remember, we can stop this. Um, and really, it's really to illustrate what CD4 and viral load could mean so that you understand it better. So if this is a train that's traveling down the tracks, and you can see it's, it's got to cross a bridge, but the bridge is open and the tracks are broken, so. When the train gets to the edge of the cliff, it's going to go over the cliff uh, because the tracks are broken. If you imagine the speed at which the train is traveling as the viral load and the distance from the broken track as the CD4, that gives you some perspective. So if you're not on treatment, you're not taking medication right now, and your CD4 count is really high, then you're really far away from the broken tracks. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, so there's no need to panic. But if your viral load is very high, you're moving quite fast. So there's no point to waiting too long. In fact, now all the evidence suggests that actually treating HIV, even if your train is slowish and even with a good CD4 count, even if you're far away, it's better to treat HIV even if the CD4 count is above 500. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? The speed and the distance, those are the things. So if you're not on treatment, really you want to know how fast am I traveling and how far am I away from those broken tracks? So the further you wait, the better. The slower the train is traveling, the better. And some people have naturally good CD4s and very, very low viral load. So their train is really crawling mm -hmm. and they're really far away. So they can really relax. Uh, but most people, that's not the situation. They need treatment. Okay. And really this graph, I don't really need to spend too much time on this. This just shows that the lower the CD4 counts comes, the more problems a person can experience. And actually, you know, waiting for the problems is not the answer. It's better to be on treatment and not to experience problems. And sometimes people say, I feel well, I don't feel anything wrong, I, I, I don't really need treatment, surely I don't need treatment. But I guess, you know, this, my, my message there is, why, why, why should you have to suffer something bad happen to you before you need treatment? It's better not to experience any ill effect. And actually, uh, we talked about those, the army troops going fast asleep and not being able to defend a person from infection. Uh, so that is one mechanism by which HIV causes problems. The other mechanism is actually uh, when the virus directly affects the kidneys, the brain, and the bowel. So in the, when it affects the bowel, it can cause terrible diarrhea, though HIV itself causes infections that can cause diarrhea, which causes HIV wasting. It can affect the muscles and cause HIV wasting. HIV dementia is the virus effect on the brain causing memory loss. And HIV effect on the kidney can actually lead to kidney failure. So we have some patients who need dialysis and things because 
by the time they came to a clinic, the kidneys had failed because a virus had attacked the kidneys or caused a problem in the kidneys. So the two mechanisms by which HIV causes problems is its direct effect on the kidney, the brain, or in the bowel, or by the indirect effect of weakening the CD4, the army generals, and causing the immune system to become weak. So the two main mechanisms. Actually, one of the things I haven't mentioned is actually there is a third way as well, which is because there's a virus in your body, and the virus, uh, when there's a virus in the body, the body's trying to fight it. That's called inflammation. And that can lead to problems maybe with heart disease and stroke later in life. So that, that's not a good thing to have as well. It's another reason to be on treatment, to try and reduce the level of inflammation in the blood. Okay. So really what treatments does, we've talked about the tank of water, and I can show in the first tank, the viral load is high, where there's production of virus and destruction of virus. And in the second tank, we've started treatment and turned off the virus, and the virus has become really low. And that's when your viral load is undetectable, and that's the place to be, because it can't cause any mischief. And what treatment do we use? The treatment we use is highly active antiretroviral therapy, or heart. So we're going to have a whole session just on treatment in a few weeks' time, so hopefully you come for that. And we can talk about the ins and outs of treatment and how they work as well. And they're different. We use a combination of treatments just really does so effective in stopping those rain clouds. So the reservoir keeps draining, it keeps draining, it keeps draining, and the level of virus goes down. And we've taken the rain away, we've taken the clouds away, okay? And we can reduce the viral right down. And really, being managed for HIV is much more than being managed for virus, because actually, we know that there's stigma associated with having HIV. We know there's ignorance, and we know that in addition to the physical effects of HIV on the kidney, on the bowel, on the brain, and all the rest of it that we talked about, HIV also has an emotional impact and a psychological impact. So we've talked about its effect on the body, but we will talk also in the future about how it affects an individual emotionally and psychologically and what response there is. So well-being in our clinic is much more about than having an undetectable viral load. It's also being emotionally and psychologically as well as physically healthy. So I'm going to end there, uh, and here ends the presentation um, uh, for those of you watching at home. So if you've got any questions from that, don't forget to write them down and take them to your clinic. Uh, and for those here today, we're going to have a Q&A session on that. Thank you.